Josephine had an irresistible attraction. She was not a woman of regular beauty. She had that grace which is more beautiful than beauty's self. As our good La Fontaine used to say, she had the soft abandon, the supple and elegant movements, the graceful negligence of Creole women. Her temper was always even, good and kind. She was affable and indulgent to everybody without exception to persons. She was not a woman of superior intellect, but her exquisite politeness, her great familiarity with society and court life and their innocent artifices always taught her at a moment's notice what to say and do. The emperor had loved her much and retained for her a feeling of affection which had been strengthened by custom and her own affectionate qualities. One would have said that she was born for the part which her elevation and rank in Napoleon's side forced her to play. The partner of his fortune, she had admirably seconded him with the ascendancy of her grace, her gentleness, and her goodness. She was the wife of his glory as much as the wife of his person, for she had wedded his glory as much as she had wedded his person. Although she was a total stranger to politics and affairs of government, she had, as far as lay in her power, won over to Napoleon the favor of the various political parties. She was fond of luxury and extravagant, perhaps more than her spirit of charity should have warranted, for her extravagance often made it impossible for her to satisfy her charitable tastes. I may add, however, that on frequent occasions, Napoleon very generously made up to her the deficiencies caused by her habit of spending money too readily. There was a charm and a delicacy about her way of obliging people or of thanking them for a service which won all hearts. In her misfortune, she showed a resignation which never failed her. What rendered her sorrow almost too heavy for her to bear was the inflexible necessity of having to separate from the emperor. He never neglected her. Prince Eugène and Queen Hortense showed a nobility of sentiment and a dignity under these circumstances, which are greatly to their honor. Their devotion was admirable. They helped their mother to keep up courage, and yet whilst lavishing their tenderness upon her, did not forget their duty to their adopted father. Queen Hortense had been summoned to the Tuileries and arrived there at the moment when the emperor was returning from having conducted, or rather having helped to carry Josephine to her rooms. Accompanying her to the door of her mother's apartments, the emperor said to her, go daughter, keep up courage. Oh, sire, I have courage, she answered, barely able to utter the words for her tears and sobs. Prince Eugène told me at Vienna that in the first interview which he had with his mother in Napoleon's presence after the divorce had been decided upon, Empress Josephine had asked for the crown of Italy for her son, that he, Eugène, did not wish to receive anything except from the emperor's kindness, fearing that this favor might be considered as the price of his mother's divorce, and had begged her not to insist on this request, that the emperor, touched by his reserve, had assured him that he did very well to trust himself to his tenderness. The marriage of Napoleon with Empress Josephine had been declared null by the Senatus Consultum, and after some time, the officiality of Paris severed the religious ties. The deed of the civil marriage contained clauses of nullity, which would have been enough to justify a divorce. As it was revolting to the emperor to make use of this means, he would not allow these points to be put forward. The two witnesses had been Monsieur Calmelet, the friend of the Beauharnais family, and Captain Le Marois, General Bonaparte's aide-de-camp. The latter was not of age four, born in 1776. He was barely 20 years old in 1796 at the time of the marriage. The age of the two spouses had not been correctly stated. The whole proceedings had been marked with the irregularity which was the natural consequence of the time at which the marriage took place. 
The birth certificates of neither had been asked for, or at any rate, had only been casually examined. In the Register General, Bonaparte was described as having been born on February 5th, 1768. As a matter of fact, he was really born on August 15th, 1769. This made some people suppose that Napoleon was born before Corsica was ceded to France. Was the reason that this date was so given the carelessness of General Bonaparte's solicitor? Or did the general himself wish, by adding 18 months to his age, to make it more on a level with that of Madame de Beauharnais, who on her side reduced her age for the same purpose? None of Napoleon's brothers was born on the 5th of February. After the sorrowful and imposing ceremony which unloosened the bonds of a union which, had Josephine been fruitful, would have lasted as long as their lives. She who till then had been empress went down to her apartment. The emperor re-entered his study, sad and silent, and let himself fall on the sofa where he usually sat in a state of complete depression. He remained there some moments, his head leaning on his hand, and when he rose, his face was distorted. Orders for the departure to Trianon had been given in advance. When it was announced that the carriages were ready, Napoleon took his hat and said, Mineval, come with me. I followed him up the little winding staircase which communicated between his study and the Empress's apartment. Josephine was alone and appeared wrapped in the most painful reflection. The noise we made in entering attracted her attention, and springing up, she threw herself on the Emperor's neck, sobbing and crying. He pressed her to his bosom, kissing her over and over again, but in the excess of her emotion, she had fainted. I ran to the bell and summoned help. The Emperor, wishing to avoid the sight of a grief which he was unable to assuage, placed the Empress in my arms as soon as he saw she was coming back to consciousness, ordered me not to leave her, and withdrew rapidly by the drawing rooms of the ground floor, at the door of which his carriage was waiting for him. After the emperor's disappearance, women who entered laid her on a couch and did what was necessary for her recovery. In her confusion, she took my hands and earnestly prayed me to tell the emperor not to forget her and to assure him of an affection which would survive any and every event. She made me promise to send her news of him on my arrival at Trianon and to see that he wrote to her. It seemed to be difficult for her to allow me to depart as if my departure would break the last tie by which she was connected to Napoleon. I left her. Grieved at so deep a sorrow and so sincere an affection, I felt very miserable all along my route, and I could not help deploring that the rigorous exactions of politics should violently break the bonds of an affection which had stood the test of time to impose another union full of uncertainty. On my arrival at Trianon, I informed the emperor of what had happened after his departure and gave him the messages with which I had been entrusted. Napoleon, who was still under the impression of the scenes of the day, spoke at great length of Josephine's good qualities and of the sincerity of her affection for him. He considered her as a devoted friend and always retained an affectionate remembrance of her. The same evening, he wrote her a letter to comfort her in her solitude. Hearing from those who saw her at La Malmaison, she frequently cried. He again wrote to her, complaining tenderly of her want of courage and telling her how much he suffered by the separation. It was at Trianon that began the official negotiations of Napoleon's marriage, which of course could not be commenced without it being certain that Napoleon's offer would be accepted. The marriage with the House of Saxony, which presented no difficulties, was dropped after careful examination. And in consideration of the dependent position of this state, which could be of no use and would be rather an embarrassment in case of war. There remained then the Russian marriage and the Archduchess of Austria. The latter was reserved in Napoleon's secret thoughts. The emperor spent a week at Trianon in unusual idleness, trying to amuse himself with shooting and hunting. He went to visit La Malmaison, the lady who a few days before had been his wife. On the eve of his return to Paris, he wished to receive her at dinner at Trianon with her daughter, the Queen Hortense, and having noticed that this palace was not sufficiently protected against the cold, authorized Empress Josephine to go to the Elysee there to wait the conclusion of the necessary arrangements for her definite establishment there. 
Josephine was obliged shortly afterwards to leave for the Chateau de Navarre in consequence of the imminent arrival of the new empress. Recalled to Paris by public affairs, Napoleon was surprised at the solitude of his palace, no longer animated by Empress Josephine's presence. He felt the want of the domestic life to which he was accustomed, and this void was not always filled by the cares of government, which, by reason of his growing activity and foresight, which overlooked nothing, were constantly multiplying. In the meanwhile, the answer from St. Petersburg was delayed, and Napoleon began to suspect that this delay covered a hidden refusal. The pretext given were the question of a difference of creeds and the necessity of consulting the dowager empress and of overcoming her objections. In the course of January, Monsieur de Metternich had dropped a hint in the course of a conversation which General Narbonne, who, having no instructions to answer him on this point, had allowed the insinuation to pass unnoticed. It became necessary to ascertain whether the court of Austria was disposed as in the past. First steps with this object in view were made to the Austrian ambassador by Messieurs de la Borde and Samonville. In the course of a conversation in the drawing room with the secretary of the Austrian ambassador, whose name was Flore. These gentlemen spoke as if on their own initiative so that the emperor, not being in any way bound by what they said, should be at perfect liberty, in case of need, to refuse any responsibility for their statements. This suggestion, which was eagerly seized upon by Monsieur Fleury, seemed to confirm what was already known of the friendly state of mind of Austria. On the other hand, and almost at the same time, letters came from Russia, which did not satisfy the emperor, who was not in the least blind to the real reason of the delays of the Russian cabinet. Other considerations which made Napoleon hesitate were the age of Princess Anne, who was not yet of an age to marry, and supposing the difference of religions to be a genuine objection, the fact that he would be forced to admit Russian priests and all the intrigues they would bring with them into the interior of the Tuileries Palace. Did the emperor's feelings of his dignity allow him to renounce the friendly disposition of Austria, to wait until it might suit the Tsar and the Dowager Empress to make up their minds? Such an attitude would have exposed him to the laughter of Europe. Napoleon made up his mind at the right moment and showed on this occasion, as on a hundred others, that no one better than he knew how to make use of his time. He saw that the Duc de Vicence Calancourt obtained nothing from Emperor Alexander but evasive answers. In order to avoid being reproached with frivolity and inconstancy and to ascertain exactly how matters stood, Napoleon wrote directly to the Russian sovereign. In this letter, he told the Tsar that after a series of delays, which without any plausible motive were prolonging his state of uncertainty, he could no longer delay from obtaining a clear answer which would put an end to this equivocal state of affairs. Alexander's answer arrived at last. It was full of flattering protestations. He expressed his desire to multiply the bonds which attached him to the Emperor Napoleon, but left matters exactly where they were after the first overture. Napoleon judging that his own dignity and that of the nation would be compromised by waiting any longer, took upon himself the initiative of refusing the marriage. He had taken care before doing so to assure himself of the entire cooperation of Prince Schwarzenberg, Austrian ambassador to Paris, who vouchsafed the disposition of the court of Austria. From this moment, Napoleon's choice was made in favor of the Archduchess. He called together a privy council to examine which of the three marriages, that is to say, the Russian, the Austrian, and Saxon alliances preference should be given. The three questions were freely discussed at the council, the emperor listening with the greatest attention to the various opinions for and against these different plans, but did not express his private feelings on the matter. It was only on the eve of the same day that Napoleon signified his decision to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Prince Eugène 
was charged with the mission to carry the formal announcement to Prince Schwarzenberg, Austrian ambassador, with whom an appointment was made on the morrow for the purpose of offering the Archduchess's hand. The marriage contract was signed in the evening. The Duke de Cadors first dispatched to the Duke de Vicence Calencourt, referring to the proposal of marriage, was sent off from Paris on November 24, 1809. It is true that at the time it reached its destination, Emperor Alexander was away from St. Petersburg. On January 10, 1810, the Duke de Vicence asked for a definite answer within a period of 10 days. The answer had not yet been given on the 6th of February. Emperor Napoleon, who has generally been represented as a man who would brook no delays, who would have any plan carried into execution as soon as it had been made, had nevertheless been waiting for two months and a half for the solution of a question of capital importance and the immediate solution of which was of the highest importance to himself. The princess, whom the emperor had chosen, was the eldest daughter of Emperor Francis, who until 1805 had been Francis II, the emperor of Germany. After the creation of the Federation of the Rhine, which changed the organization of the German states, this prince had taken the title of Francis I, Emperor of Austria, a title which since then he has retained. This sovereign was married four times. His first wife, a princess of Württemberg, whom he married at the age of 20, died two years after the marriage. His second marriage was with Maria Theresa, daughter of Ferdinand IV, king of the two Sicilies, with whom he lived in a union which the harmony of their tastes rendered a very close one. There may be seen in the imperial palace in Austria, and notably in the park of Luxembourg small farms, where the illustrious couple delighted in forgetting their rank and giving themselves up to the pleasure and occupations of a country life. It was from this second marriage alone that the Emperor Francis had any children. The first was Marie Louise, formerly Empress of the French, succeeded in the following order by the late Archduchess Leopoldine, who was Empress of Brazil, Archduke Ferdinand, who became Emperor, Archduchess Maria Clementina, wife of Prince Leopold of Salerno, late Archduchess Caroline, who married Prince Frederick of Saxony, Archduke Francis Charles, who married the daughter of the late King Maximilian of Bavaria, and finally, the Archduchess Marianne, whose eccentricities have kept her away from the court and which probably stood in the way of any marriage. The Emperor Francis's third wife, whom Napoleon knew, was Princess Marie Louise Beatrice d'Este, who was her husband's cousin. She was fond of literature, her favorite author being Augustus Lafontaine, the German author of French origin, who is looked on in Germany as the founder of his school. The new empress exercised great influence over her husband from the beginning of their married life, an influence which was somewhat to the dissatisfaction of the empress brothers. She hated the French with a hatred, which she had inherited from her father. Her life was cut short by her bad health. The imperial palace used frequently to resound with cries torn from her by violent attacks of a nervous disease. She died in 1816, barely 26 years of age, leaving the Emperor Francis a widower for the third time. Some surprise was expressed when he married for a fourth time in the same year with the second daughter of the first marriage of King Maximilian of Bavaria. This princess had been married before to the crown prince of Württemberg, who in his turn had become king. Having been divorced from her husband, she had retired to the house of her eldest sister, the wife of Prince Eugène de Beauharnais. She lived there in great retirement, apparently forgotten by the world and certainly not foreseeing the destiny reserved for her, an imperial crown in compensation for the crown she had lost.